Okay, again, this is uh, comparing the state of data now with the state of Linbox 18 months ago, so I know that there have been some uh, developments in, on, on the Linbox side uh, since then, but um, that said, uh, data has a, actually the biggest difference is a loss-like interface for doing basic matrix, matrix, matrix vector operations. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more advanced system than when uh, uh, Linbox has traditionally had. Uh, and I'll discuss it in greater detail later. Right now, Layla does not have any support for so-called black box methods. I took all of that stuff out just because it was not part of our goal in uh, developing the library. Anything which I included from Linbox would have to be ported. So uh, what was not really necessary, I did not include. Um, uh, compared with Linbox, um, as I say, traditionally, uh, 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 it's available in Linbox. Layla has a much simpler set of vector representations. Dense, uh, sparse, and sort of hybrid. I'll discuss what the hybrid vector is uh, it later. It maintains, though, the same uh, philosophy of genericity that one doesn't, for example, have to use a particular vector type which the library provides. One only has to supply a vector type which satisfies a certain interface. I'll discuss this uh, a bit more down the road. What Linbox calls fields, uh, we call rings in Layla. Uh, and we've also changed the interface slightly to, um, uh, to account for the fact that not all non-zero elements are invertible. Uh, I think uh, if one, for example, wants to operate over the integers, it really doesn't make any sense to call the integers a field, as, as Linbox does. So we make that name change. OK. Um, now here's a sticky point, which is licensing. Um, I license Lego under the general public license and not the lesser general public license for the following reason. So uh, Linbox, as uh, uh, Boyer mentioned, is licensed under the Western General Public License. Uh, the idea being, uh, essentially, that if you develop a library under the General Public License, any other program which uses that library is considered uh, a copyright law to be a derived work. And that means, by the terms of the license, it must also be under the General Public License. Under the Western General Public License, the principle is supposed to be that uh, why if you make a change to the library itself, you must still uh, uh, respect the terms of the license, you must still distribute your changes under the same license, or you can uh, also uh, change, or, uh, distribute the derived version of the library under the general public license, so you can sort of upgrade it, but otherwise you're not allowed to change the license. However, you can write a program which uses the library and license it however you wish. So this is often, the LGPL for this reason is often used for system libraries in uh, uh, GNU Linux operating system for exactly that reason, so that proprietary software can be developed which uses the libraries but doesn't have to uh, be distributed in the same license. Okay, so the problem with using this uh, LGPL with uh, Linbox and with respectively Neda is that these are template libraries. These are not the same as ordinary shared libraries on the system. I did some research on this, and the wording of the LGPL uh, doesn't actually cover this case. Uh, in particular, any reasonable use of a template library requires essentially including much of the source code for the library uh, in the program when you're compiling the program. And um, as I say, this is not covered by the clauses in the LGPO which permit a program which uses the library uh, to be licensed however one wishes. The upshot is essentially any program which uses Linbox, respectively, they uh, that were under the LGPL must be licensed the same way, must be licensed under the same LGPL or GPL, respectively. Um, because there's a lot of potential for confusion, I decided just to switch to the GPL. Now, that said, I have no problem with Layla being used in, uh, should I say, a software which does not have a compatible license. 
Uh, and it's easy to fix this problem by adding an exception clause. So uh, there's actually already a precedent for this, namely the uh, standard template library distributed by the GNU project. Um, so their implementation of the standard template library actually has exactly the same problem. And um, uh, they actually solve it by they, switch, uh, they actually switched to the GPL a few years ago and added an exception clause which allows uh, linking against any proprietary program or library. So then, uh, yeah, then linking with proprietary libraries using a proprietary software is unambiguously permitted. There's no problem anymore. But this is actually a, a, a problem with the licensing in Winbox. For example, uh, when Winbox is used in proprietary software. This is actually not allowed. So anyway. So that's uh, uh, one sticky point, and that's the uh, issue of the licensing. OK, so enough about uh, legal issues. We get to the technical aspects. So I'm going to go through uh, uh, some of the important parts of the library piece by piece. So first of all, uh, at the lowest level, we have the ring interface. It tells you how to do um, basic ring arithmetic. This is mostly the same as the Linux field interface. Um, mostly, I, I took the functions one for one, few uh, changes. Um, I eliminated this whole envelope archetype abstract business. If you don't know what that is, you don't have to. Um, it, as far as I could tell, it does not work, actually. Anyway, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not necessary. Um, I created this... Uh, uh, an alternative mechanism which uh, serves the same purpose. So, uh, so essentially a type of abstract ring so that if one maybe uh, doesn't want to um, use so many different instantiations or was working with a case where one might otherwise have to instantiate a, a, a particular class a hundred times or a hundred different, slightly different uh, ring types, uh, one can use a, a certain mechanism to uh, to eliminate that at a cost of some performance. Uh, that we've tested, and it actually works. And it's a lot simpler than the, uh, the similar mechanism which existed in the box. That said, it's not really intended to be the main application uh, of our data. It's only a, an extra possibility. Uh, one small thing is that inversion division operations, as I mentioned, we uh, changed the field interface to a ring interface. So, of course, with rings, uh, uh, inverses and quotients may not necessarily exist in a given ring, so the operations now return a Boolean value to indicate whether the inverse respect of the quotient exists in the ring. Okay, uh, moving one by what? Um, we have loss like operations. So this, I think, was um, actually a, a weakness traditionally uh, in, in the inbox, but it was. Uh, originally developed 15 years ago, there was so much effort put into creating a beautiful field interface with you know, all sorts of uh, you know, design possibilities, shall we say, and virtually no interface, or no, no uh, thought put into uh, how to, for example, compute the thought to vectors, which is actually, if you're developing a, uh, a serious linear algebra library, we want to have you know, the uh, best performance in the world, really where you need to put the most effort. It's, it's a subtle problem. Of course, uh, Bryce Boyer's talk uh, talks a great deal about uh, what Linbox is currently doing in this direction. So, um, Data has done something actually quite similar uh, along these lines. So first, we have a single fixed loss-like interface with what can just, what just use. This means um, I can take any two matrices which can possibly be multiplied, that is, they're defined over the same ring, they have compatible sizes, but they can have different, uh, for example, representation types, one could be dense, one could be sparse, one could be, um, you know, one could uh, maybe not even be an actual matrix, but rather just uh, a class which uh, appears to the outside world as a matrix, whatever. One can take any two of these and feed them into a single function and, um, uh, and get the product. For example, um, so at the, at the beginning, one doesn't have to think at all about the 
question of which interface to use in, in what situation. It's all the same. Um, and the, I should say the interface is also modeled after loss. So for example, uh, our matrix multiplication is called gen, G-E-N-N. Uh, exactly the same as with loss. Um, then uh, the actual implementations are divided in these modules. Each module is uh, implements a, um, possibly well one or more highly specialized operations for special cases. Uh, and these modules are then arranged in a hierarchy, and then in principle, the way uh, the way it operates is something you start with uh, the top um, module of the hierarchy, and it asks. Somehow the system asks whether that top module provides an implementation which works with our input. You know, given that we have this type of matrix over this type of ring and this type of matrix over this type of ring, can we use this or the operations in this module to multiply them, for example? And if a given module does not provide those operations, then pass it on to the next module down the stack, and so on and so on. And um, the resolution of which module to select is actually done at compile time, which is um, uh, I mean, it has benefits for performance, of course, if the operations are quite low level, and um, it requires some template magic, but it works. So essentially, uh, when one compiles a program which uses this, uh, assuming one has all the optimizations enabled, what should appear in the final output code is pretty well just a direct call to the, uh, to the most efficient method available for dealing with unit support formats. Right at the bottom of the hierarchy, we also have a so-called generic module which implements absolutely everything for every possible combination of inputs which are compatible, that is. Um, and I mean, it only implements them uh, uh, naively using you know, the simplest possible methods. So this means it is in no way fast. But it's a fallback. It will be available if everything else fails. So examples, I just mentioned the generic module. This implements everything naively. Uh, we have the um, so-called Strassen module, which implements fast, uh, fast matrix multiplication and nothing else. So it just, uh, just has one operation, fast matrix multiplication. Uh, the ZP module uh, then implements uh, sort of somewhat optimized operations for uh, integers modulo some modulus. So for example, delayed mod account, where say if you're computing the dot product of two vectors, uh, it's and, and you're doing this mod p, then the, uh, it's rather silly to multiply and then reduce and then multiply and reduce and multiply and reduce you know, every time you uh, get an element. Instead, you should uh, multiply and add a little uh, uh, chunk of the vector at a time. And then in the end, uh, before you overflow your, your uh, uh, representation type, then reduce mod p. So this is a, a trick which was introduced into Winbox many, many years ago. and um, it's also been taken up by data and is implemented in this module. There are other modules which uh, wrap existing libraries. So for example, well, uh, we have a module for WebMary, uh, which does extremely efficient uh, operations, but just for dense matrices over GF2. So no other case is covered, but just that. And we also have a, um, a module for uh, C plus. This is uh, actually uh, essentially the same as what uh, Winbox provides with the F plus package. Um, so this, this, the C plus module will take or will uh, um, yeah. So this this provides operations for dense matrices using a floating point representation type. And then the idea is this sits somewhere in the in the hierarchy, and then there's something above it which um, will take, say, a matrix over GFB and chop it up appropriately and then feed the partial matrices down uh, to the next module 
uh, for C plus, and then get the output back and uh, reduce modulo P. And it works. And um, I have not had a chance actually to benchmark against uh, benchmark it against F plus, unfortunately. But um, I have benchmarked it against the naive implementation, and there it's uh, uh, it's vastly, vastly superior. Um, and the nice thing about this is this, as long as you have all the libraries available, and as long as you're using uh, matrix types for which you can apply the given library, then the use is automatic. You don't have to do anything special. You just call the matrix multiplication function, and if, if it can, it will feed those, those matrices to plus and multiply them really efficiently. But if you don't have those libraries available, you don't have to install them beforehand. Uh, they either will function correctly without them, but you may, in many more cases, uh, be stuck using uh, naive implementations of things, so the performance will not be nearly as good. But it will function. Okay. Um, vector representations. I mentioned, uh, compared with uh, what was traditionally a min box, are greatly simplified. Uh, so yes, the library, as I say, um, defines, rather than saying you must use these vector types, it says um, these are the interfaces which vectors must satisfy. And uh, as long as you provide a vector which satisfies a given interface, you can feed that vector to the rest of the library, and it works. Um, so there are three different interfaces, as I mentioned before, three different uh, vector interfaces which are provided, or, or uh, which are supported, dense, sparse, and hybrid. A dense vector is just an STL vector of ring elements, except that you don't I mean, in, in implementing a dense vector, one doesn't have to provide any operations which change the vector's length. So push back, resize, these kinds of things. One doesn't have to uh, provide that functionality. It doesn't hurt when, or when one does provide that functionality, but it will never be used within the library because it's a, if a, if it's a dense vector, it's supposed to have a fixed length. Um, a sparse vector, on the other hand, must appear to be an STL vector of index element pairs. So if you iterate over the vector, you get uh, a sequence of pairs back, uh, the first element being the column or the, the index of the given element, and the second element being a ring element uh, at that index. Uh, the idea is that the uh, second element should always be non zero, because if it were zero, then you don't need that. Uh, that entry in the vector at all, you can leave it out. Uh, in this case, one does have to provide certain methods which allow adding new elements to the vector or querying the vector. Uh, in particular, pushback and clear, possibly others, I have to go back and check uh, what's required. The important thing about this is, while the sparse vector uh, must provide that interface, it doesn't have to implemented as an STL vector of pairs. In particular, Leila provides already a vector which one can use, which is actually just a bit of a wrapper. It takes internally it stores a vector as a pair of vectors. So one vector of indices, one vector of um, ring elements, and then adapts that interface to make it appear to the outside world as though it were a vector of pairs. Um, the reason for this is uh, the storage of a pair of vectors is usually a lot more efficient, in particular when the uh, data type of the ring element and the index type have different sizes. Then uh, there's a huge gain in performance, <coughs> memory efficiency, by uh, using a pair of vectors rather than uh, a vector of pairs. There is, however, nothing stopping one from just using a standard SDL vector uh, of pairs. If one wants to use that, one can uh, use that with all the functionality of the library, it will still function. 
Okay, over GF2 we have a few um, differences. So in fact, when I said there are three uh, vector types, I was actually lying, but actually um, five vector types because uh, we have for uh, sparse and dense vectors, we actually have a special interface for vectors over GF2. In particular, dense vectors over GF2 must uh, provide additionally an um, iterator called word iterator, which iterates over entire words. So rather than iterating one element at a time and just getting one, essentially one bit of information for each iteration, one can iterate over an entire machine word at a time and get 32 or 64 bits, respectively, uh, of information, making most operations 32, respectively, 64 times as fast, which is quite important for performance. Um, the virtually all operations over GF2 will be uh, done by words rather than by individual bit operations. Um, at the same time, sparse vectors don't need elements because all uh, non-zero elements are one. So a sparse vector over GF2 is actually just a list of uh, indices identifying all the non-zero elements, period. So I should say that an STL vector of indices. Uh, I guess one could also in principle use an STL list of indices, but uh, performance then uh, practice is terrible. So STL vector is better. Okay, now I mentioned another type of vector called a hybrid vector. I have not described this yet. This is a new uh, feature in Leila that is not present in the box. Um, it combines, as one might imagine, uh, the features of sparse and dense vectors. Uh, it's only available at the moment over GF2. Implementing uh, it for other types, as such would be, for other features to say, as such would be, uh, to say the least, tricky. Um, the idea is essentially if you have this vector, this big uh, vector sitting in a vector space, um, you divide the indices into blocks. Each block is uh, the size of one machine word. So the first block, for example, contains indices 0 through, say, 63, and the second one is 64 through 127, and so on. Then the interface which the vector must export is an STL vector pair similar to a sparse uh, vector for an arbitrary field. But each pair now is the index of a block on the one hand and the word which goes in that block. So it's roughly analogous to a sparse vector except that the elements, rather than having an individual elements in uh, uh, the second element of the pair, one has the word which goes into the corresponding block. Uh, this is particularly nice in case where you have a, um, a vector which has some uh, ranges of indices which are particularly sparse and then others which are particularly dense. Uh, and I find in practice this happens uh, frequently with matrices which come out of the So it was developed with exactly this in mind. Uh, there's a data type called hybrid vector which implements this required interface and exactly an uh, analogy with a sparse vector, it stores the vector as a pair of STL vectors, one vector containing the indices and one vector containing uh, the words. Um, one can, I should say, hybrid vector as well as sparse vector are parameterized uh, by the index respectively, uh, in the case of hybrid vector word type, so one could, uh, if I, I mean, in practice, uh, types of matrices which one, with which one can actually work in practice, uh, it suffices to use a 16-bit index, uh, column index, uh, if one's working on a 64-bit machine, and then one has a 64-bit word, so you have a two-byte uh, index type and an eight-byte word type, so there, uh, there's actually quite a huge difference in length there. So actually using the uh, pair of vectors is quite sensible in this case. Okay. Uh, a little bit about matrices. So the matrix interface it is largely similar to that of Lidbox as of four, uh, 18 months ago. Um, so in particular, 
one can iterate over the rows or the columns, uh, or sometimes, depending on the matrix type, one can uh, iterate over both rows and columns. So I, I should clarify that. This means that a given matrix type can export an iterator, which allows you to iterate over the rows, and it can export an iterator, which allows you to iterate over the columns, or it can export both types of iterators. Um, and then when one does that, and if one iterates, say, over the rows, then the, uh, the data type which one gets when one references that iterator is the vector, just corresponding to a row vector, and likewise with the columns. Uh, Leda provides two matrix classes, respectively dense matrix and sparse matrix. Um, dense matrix is almost identical to what uh, uh, Pointer is describing of the loss matrix. Basically, it stores the, um, the elements of the matrix in just one big block and then has a, uh, a particular vector type which uh, allows you to iterate over, the, or allows you to represent a row, respectively a column. Um, uh, relatively easily, and um, yeah, and then uh, it makes those with row or respectively column types appear to be ordinary vectors to the rest of the library. Um, a sparse matrix is essentially a vector of row vectors, and one can specify what type of row vectors will have. Usually, one just uses a sparse matrix with a sparse vector, and one just gets an ordinary sparse matrix with a row. Uh, or the rows are then just ordinary sparse vectors. So the sparse matrix in particular only uh, exports row vectors. So you cannot iterate over the columns of the sparse matrix because uh, it's much more difficult to iterate over columns of a sparse matrix represented by rows than over the row vectors. Whereas a dense matrix provides both because it's basically equally easy to iterate over uh, row and column vectors. Um, one little exception to what I just said, if you, do, if you define a dense matrix over GF2, you don't get the same data type. You actually get a completely different um, uh, uh, dense matrix, which packs everything into uh, bit vectors, so everything is really uh, efficiently stored. But then uh, it's really difficult to provide row vectors. Oh, sorry, uh, to provide column vectors. So it only provides row vectors. And the reason it's difficult to provide column vectors is that while you can iterate over the individual elements, of a column quite easily uh, to get a word out of uh, a column is extremely difficult. You have to literally read uh, the bits from 64 rows and then assemble them into a word. And that's an extremely costly operation. So if, uh, if you say you were to call some, some method on um, uh, which then you know somehow sees that there are column vectors available and, uh, and then tries to assemble them and then use, uh, uh, and then iterate over the words, uh, it's going to be extremely, extremely slow. So there's a general philosophy here that we try not to export operations, which we, well, while we could export them in principle, would be extremely slow if we try. Okay. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, data is uh, intended for direct methods, and that means it's really useful to have a notion of submatrix, respectively subvector. And so data provides generic interfaces for this. So subvectors are uh, supported by traits. Um, the idea, well, essentially, um, if you use, um, so if you use a declaration like this in your code, and vector is a, um, if any vector type which, uh, uh, which is handed to you, then you get the type which corresponds to a subvector of that. So you can then declare, say, a subvector and then say, well, okay, I want the, the subvector corresponding to indices A through B. And, and then you work with that subvector as, as though it were just an ordinary vector. Um, if this vector which you got is constant, maybe um, you try to use a subvector here. Well, it'll try to instantiate a class which um, uh, which uses forbidden functionality because the vector is constant, it's not allowed to modify anything, and then you get a whole bunch of compiler errors. For that reason, we also have a constant subvector type. So, use this second declaration 
if the vector with which you are working is constant and you use the first one if the vector is uh, not constant. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, I mean, yeah, why make it so complicated? Well, the reason is that this vector type could be an STL vector. And then, well, we don't have the luxury of, say, defining a, um, uh, our own you know, type within the definition of you know, some system library. So for this reason, we use these so-called traits to, uh, to provide that. Whereas, OK, so matrices are, um, well, there's actually a class which provides some matrices. Actually, this is a, a slight, uh, this is slightly uh, incorrect. There is this class, but it's not actually the way one should do it. One, act, or one actually has available a type defined in matrix. You just say matrix colon colon submatrix, and then you get uh, the type corresponding to the submatrix. OK. Um, so for sparse and hybrid vectors, uh, well, so I mentioned uh, the sparse and hybrid, or sparse and hybrid vectors have this property that the, um, I mean, they're, they have an index uh, element pair. So what if your subvector starts at index 5,000? Um, you want to, or you want to treat a subvector as though it were just an ordinary vector, not a vector sort of, I don't know, shifted somehow. So um, there's a, or actually a wrapper, which is already implemented in the library, which downshifts the indices. So when you take a, a, a subvector of a sparse vector, then you get a um, something which appears to be an ordinary sparse vector, which is actually just a window into the original vector, but it does a little bit of a conversion along the way when you access an index. It, uh, it downshifts the uh, the column index so that you get the right uh, index when you access it. The same thing is true for hybrid vectors. Uh, recursion is also properly supported. That is, if you take a subvector of a subvector, then you don't uh, get you know just uh, an endless stream of subvectors. Instead, you get just a subvector of the original vector. Um, when you're doing when you're doing things over GF2. Uh, it makes things a lot faster if your subvector is uh, word aligned. That is, the index starts at a machine word boundary. Uh, and so, for this reason, there is direct support for uh, word aligned uh, subvectors. And in particular, uh, the implementations in the library are intelligent and will always try to take advantage of word alignment when it is available. <coughs> So if there's a possibility to say we have a recursive algorithm, you have a, a you know, something, um, some way of decomposing a matrix into submatrices, and it is it seems that um, say your row type of the matrix is uh, has a, uh, it's a let's say a dense vector over G of two or a hybrid vector, so the word alignment matters, then it will try to uh, do that uh, recursion at the Word boundary. Yes? Can you tell it to me? So you have your own implementation of the fact representation and there's the value representation? Or yeah, so I have an implementation which is available if you don't have Mary installed. Okay. If you do have Mary installed, it uses the Mary implementation directly. Also for vectors? Uh, for vectors, it just uses, well, a, a rough enhancement of a, an STL. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, um, okay. So, um, for sub or sub vectors and sub matrices, uh, we support all vector representations. So you can take a sub vector of any uh, vector type, respectively, uh, any matrix type using any say row type with a submatrix, whatever. Um, any supported representation type allows you to create a subvector, but there are some restrictions. For example, um, it is 
uh, not permitted to modify a hybrid or a hybrid subvector because that is uh, hybrid subvectors. I mean, uh, which are not word of lines, I should say. So it's not permitted to modify a hybrid subvector which is not word of line. The reason is that hybrid subvectors which are not word of line are already incredibly complicated, and trying to make it possible to modify them uh, is just unbelievably complicated. Makes they, 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 uh, I, I don't I don't want to touch that. So there are a few restrictions, but uh, I try to make the restrictions as light as possible. Okay. Um, one thing I added in Lega, completely new, uh, something called the um, splicer. This was uh, developed specifically uh, the eye towards uh, implementing the algorithm of Roger Lachat, which. Um, uh, Charles this morning described in his talk. Basically, it's a way of chopping a matrix up into pieces and then reassembling it in a different way in, say, some matrices. So exactly what uh, uh, so Charles describes with uh, you know, taking this F4 matrix and finding all the pivots and then constructing an upper triangular piece and then and then the remaining pieces. The splicer is uh, and this, this is basically the, uh, the intended case, you can think of it as uh, a canonical example. And then you can also use a splicer to go in the other direction once you have all of the uh, uh, final pieces, you've completed your uh, uh, calculations, and you want to reassemble uh, uh, a reasonable output matrix, you can use a splicer to reconstruct the, uh, the output matrix as well. So the concept is essentially uh, you have one huge matrix, and you have two ways of chopping it up into submatrices. And the point is that uh, the submatrices, yeah, uh, don't have to be contiguous within the original matrix, but they do have to follow certain rules so that they, you know, fit together properly. But um, you can, you can, you can have, it can have to be the case that you know this part here goes to one matrix, and then there's a part which goes to another matrix, and then there's a part which goes back to the one matrix, and so on. The splicer basically contains methods which allow you to convert a, uh, a matrix, or convert the say one decomposition into the other decomposition. So one decomposition will be essentially a set or the set of submatrices in that one according to that one plan, and then um, the other decomposition would be the, uh, the submatrices correspond to the other plan, and the splicer will convert between one and the other. Uh, in particular, in all the cases which we use right now, um, one of those decompositions is trivial. It is just the original matrix as just one big matrix, and then there's a way of dividing that into submatrices. So you can divide that original matrix into submatrices, and then in the end, reconstruct the original matrix according to the original plan, or modification there. So let's say the rows are respect to my columns of the submatrices need to be number contiguous. Um, and so the other uh, uh, aspect of this is that there are some more advanced methods than for combining splicers together. So one of the uh, difficulties uh, well, potential difficulties with Fouchard uh, Schott uh, method is you essentially have to permute columns in order to construct this uh, triangular matrix, and you have to pull the pivots to the left. Then, uh, then you do this uh, essentially uh, elimination steps, and then you construct something in the lower right. Now, if your goal then is to have a reduced row echelon form, then you need to do essentially the same thing in the lower right. You need to do a big triangular solve, and you have this little piece left over, uh, which then you need to remap back to the original locations. And, um, well, yes, yeah, so I mean, conceptually, one can understand how to uh, reconstruct the locations of the original. Uh, columns, but um, when one actually sits down and implements this, uh, in certain cases this can become quite complicated. So the splicer uh, creates a, a, a nice abstract interface to make it easier uh, to implement this. And one, so for example, one operation 
what's called composition, where you have you know, a big splicer and then you have a splicer for some uh, small submatrix. You can actually construct one big splicer which, um, uh, which takes the uh, decomposition of the, the small submatrix and then uh, uh, constructs the original matrix out of that. Um, I should also mention, this was developed with an eye towards uh, computing things over GF2. So I know that um, the existing implementations of Fashola Shaft uh, typically work over GFP, where uh, I mean, usually you do the same thing basically just by identifying column for column where each column goes. The point is with GF2, you want to work as much as possible with blocks of data. You don't want to work with individual columns because extracting individual columns is extremely expensive. So the splicer is designed with that in mind. It actually divides the matrix into blocks, so maximal contiguous regions which are then put into uh, the output matrices. So this splicer, mm -hmm. if I use it to compute the column somewhere, mm -hmm. then I can get it back to the original yeah. How, how does that change? The, like you, you store the original matrix and then just remember the permutation and you things into it, but you copy the matrix and then. So. Well, the original matrix is already gone by that point. I mean, it's or at least it's not needed at that point. Um, but we save essentially a map of where everything went, and then from there we can reconstruct how to uh, to, to rebuild the. So so how to rebuild a matrix? An output matrix uh, whose columns correspond exactly to the original matrix. That's the important part because you're not allowed to permute columns essentially with that form. You must uh, keep the column order the same. So we, you know, we, we do it in this sort of um, uh, uh, mischievous way that we read the columns and then we put it all back. You make, you make new matrices and then you just remember how they fit together. Exactly. And throw away the old one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Ah, right. five minutes. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So there are a few other goodies. Uh, they have to read and write PNG files, which uses over GF2. Uh, which is really, really useful for uh, these F4 examples. What do, um, you mean, what do you mean by UAGing? Sorry? What do you mean by UAGing? You want the PNG file whose width is exactly the number of columns of your matrix. Yeah, exactly. So you can actually, you can actually look at the PNG. I mean, it was exactly what uh, 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 Charles was showing this morning, where uh, you know, black uh, entries were zero, white or black pixels were zero, white uh, pixels were non-zero. Yeah, it's essentially the same as that, except that well, with um, GF2, it's unambiguous, so you can read those. We can read the PNG and then we can get the uh, matrix. Okay. Um, yeah, I also, uh, uh, compared with Pinbox, I've reorganized the vector matrix traits uh, to indicate both representation and storage types. So representation type is just the interface which is exported uh, so that we know what methods one should use. But then storage type says how something about how the vector or respectively matrix is stored so that, um, for example, if it's possible to use gloss, for example, or it is possible to use binary, uh, we can read that out of the storage thing. I also greatly expanded the test suite. Well, I've also thrown out parts of the test suite because I didn't incorporate everything from Linbox, so the parts which I didn't incorporate obviously are not part of the test suite, but what is there is more uh, extensively tested than what was in Linbox at the time. Okay, I'll go really quickly through the uh, layout of the source tree. Um, so from the root directory, there are basically five subdirectories. There's data, which is the library itself, uh, util, which contains command line utilities, tests, which contains the test suite, doc contains the documentation, including a tutorial for uh, new users, and then macros uh, contains just compiler macros. One doesn't have to worry about that too much. Within the data directory, uh, there are uh, subdirectories. Algorithms contains the non-trivial algorithms for, um, for example, fast matrix multiplication and so on. Gloss contains this gloss subsystem, this gloss-like subsystem, which does matrix and vector operations. Element is basically some uh, definitions that we need for ring elements. Matrix contains the actual matrix implementations as well as the interfaces which they have to satisfy. 
uh, RAND generators for um, random, randomly generated ring elements, useful for testing in particular. Uh, ring contains all uh, ring interfaces and all the ring implementations. And we have solutions, which is analogous to what uh, Richard Hoyer discussed in the last talk, uh, providing it's a, a really simple, high level interface for things like linear system solving, and which then uh, evokes the uh, respective algorithm depending on what the input is and so on. Util then contains the miscellaneous utility functions, and then vector contains vector uh, interfaces, so sort of archetypes for the interfaces, as well as the implementations that they described. Uh, in the util directory, I mentioned there are some uh, command line utilities which are useful for manipulating matrices in the command line. Uh, diff just subtracts your matrices, so you can find out if you know, something didn't work, where it went wrong. Uh, equal just tells you whether two matrices are equal. And then row echelon form constructs the possibly reduce row echelon form of the input matrix and writes it to the indicated output file. These are uh, the only, but these are the things which I needed for my work. So there's a, certainly a possibility for expansion of this list, but it's just I just have what I needed. Then uh, directory tests contains as a uh, one of my magic tests. Uh, when you use the command make check to run all the tests in a, in a sequence, it tells you whether they succeeded or not. Uh, much is already covered, but there is a, a little, uh, there's some functionality which is not at least explicitly tested in this uh, case. Okay, um, I don't have much time left, so I'm not going to uh, not go into much detail. Basically, there are a whole bunch of uh, uh, useful projects for the future with uh, Data. Some of these uh, actually will be familiar with uh, from the, the Linbox project. Um, maybe I'll just mention, for example, this one, built-in instantiations. This is exactly now what Bryce Boyer was uh, discussing in the last talk with um, uh, reducing the time and memory required to compile the library by reducing the number of instantiations against templates, which one has to do when one compiles against it. Uh, the idea essentially is explicitly instantiate templates for all the possible built-in, all combinations of built-in types. This is actually a really long list, but uh, this process of generating such a list can be automated, then it's not so bad. Building the library is then a really time-consuming process, but then once it's built, linking against it is quite fast. So compiling it against it is quite fast. Um, part of the work is already done. I've, um, uh, I have these so-called TCC files. These are these actually contain the implementations of all the non-trivial code that is the code which is not to be inlined, but to be compiled separately. They are split out. So all this code is split out into these TCC files, and they are currently just included in the header files. So one can simply refrain from including them in the header files, and then one doesn't have that code. So um, this could also uh, be another solution to the licensing issue. That is. If this were done, then the library could be relicensed under the LGPL, and as long as one never uses the TCC files, as long as one never touches them, one doesn't have to use the uh, GPL or LGPL when uh, linking against the library as well. Right, so one can then use the library then in proprietary software without any problem. Um, so, yeah, so I throw that uh, out as another possibility. Okay, many other products available, but I don't really have time to describe them, so uh, I will go through and... Uh, <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't have time to uh, construct benchmarks, but uh, I can show you offline uh, on my uh, laptop. So I have everything uh, installed and just go through it. But uh, I mean, I don't have uh, slides for that. Um, yeah. I can, so I've compared Layla, different implementations within Layla. I have not prepared benchmarks or not. I don't have the possibility to prepare benchmarks uh, against other libraries at this point, but it's not too hard to do. I mean, just it's just a matter of collecting. Yeah. Uh, I think I have a question. Uh, 
So the number of operations is, um, I mean, it's, it's basically just as with the normal dot product. The only thing is one doesn't um, uh, reduce uh, by the modulus as often. How many operations one needs then depends on your representation type, depends on the, uh, the size of the modulus. So for example, if you have an 8-bit module, so the modulus fits, or fits in an 8-bit word, um, then when it accumulates the products, the dot products, uh, uses a 32 or 64 bit word, and then it essentially never needs to mod out until it reaches the end, the, uh, until it's finished the entire vector, in any reasonable case. So, um, in that, or so in that respect, it's sort of the optimal situation. Yes, but even in that case, you have several hundred way to have to this function. I suppose, yeah. At least then, uh, it's possible to obtain a penetration just for this basic operation, even if the kind of work. Yeah, so the um, underlying implementation below this, this business of delayed modeling out is not even I mean, it just reads the vectors at the same time and then it's only the Okay, thank you. <laughs> We had a conversation uh, with the other Linux developers about feature vectors. Do you really, really uh, need low and high um, feature vectors? Um, good question. So, um, the answer is one could, in principle, get away without them. But uh, one uh, uh, useful feature sometimes is that one wants to have a, a matrix somewhere in some algorithm, or wants to uh, take a transpose of that matrix. Now suppose the matrix only exports row operators, and then one wants to take the transpose. Then the transpose matrix you only have the ability to iterate over columns. So in applications currently with Say for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the F4 solver, no. But one could see it being the case in the future. We already talked about just removing them, you're going to not align the code, and it's not really renewed, except maybe for them to do something to extract a row, extract a row, and then they die. Uh, Yeah, so it's, it's all a question of, of experience. And I would say I'd like to uh, uh, provide the functionality just because it could be that someone has some application where one needs to take the transpose of the sparse matrix, as I said, and one wants that to be efficient without having to re reconstruct the transpose explicitly. And so one wants just a window into the sparse matrix. So, um, and then it's useful to have it, but you know, if it really were never used, or when it show that it will never be used, that, it, that there's some equivalence such that it uh, never, uh, will actually never come up, then yeah, then maybe uh, maybe it doesn't maybe it's not needed. Yeah. So, so you mean PNG as opposed to bitmap? Uh, so, for example, if the matrix is uh, sparse, which is typically the case for F4, uh, the compression is quite effective. But it's not lossy, so I mean, it's, it's, it reconstructs the matrix of that. So, a list of indices would be really, really expensive. Or, I mean, typically. I mean, so um, depending, it depends heavily on how dense the matrix is. So I mean, if, if the matrix is extremely, extremely sparse, then yes, the, the list of indices will probably win in the end. Um, 
just because there's always some overhead with PNG. But, um, uh, but the thing is, I mean, if you, I mean, if you have, say, a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, I mean, it's already, you know, what, 100 million, yeah, like 100 million uh, uh, possible entries, and then even if 1% uh, of that is, uh, uh, is full, then you have a million non zero entries. That's already yeah, quite a lot of data. It's used, for example, with um, with Mary and uh, oh, wait, Lori, yes. yeah. So it's, yeah. These projects have uh, the ones who, as far as I know, they're the ones who uh, started it. I'm not aware of any previous. Maybe you can be incorrect. Maybe I'm not aware of any previous. Uh, and um, yeah, it works pretty well. And, and the nice thing is you can go to the, in an image editor and actually see the matrix. You can visualize you know, what happened when you, uh, you, can, you can test your code you know, for computing the reduced regression platform by pulling up the matrix and saying, is this matrix being reduced regression platform? Just from the appearance. Uh, you don't have to give the PNG uses to the problem. Yeah, uh, even, even Never had speeds that said uh, was much overhead in using it. Of course, it's all this, when you have very small ones, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you're using the GD library to encode it, right? So, because now that Mary has direct PNG support, which is the PNG, which is like a, a lot faster than this GD business, so like you can, and you can say, like, give me a set uh, uh, 9 compression, and it's, I, like, Compared to the kind of uh, another human readable format, which is like plain text, uh, it's going to be smaller to just uh, do the kind of human readable format. Yeah, it's in the news uh, right now that you can just call function. Okay. 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 Implement modules. So, uh, as I mentioned, this um, uh, boss system. Well, okay, so the question is what, what the background libraries are. So, if you have, uh, uh, if you want to, for example, implement a ring type, you um, just have to implement a ring type. Yeah, uh, but um, if it's really about linear algebra, then one can implement uh, new modules for the boss interface. And it's really intended for this purpose that one. Uh, Easily adding functionality. But at what level do you use? Like, do you ever actually call PLE decomposition on memory? Do you call like grammar system solving? Like, like how high level like do you go? Um, so the main thing is that the um, uh, that some or, so, so if the library exports some functionality. There has mm -hmm. to be some interface within Lega which corresponds to it. Uh, so, for example, triangular system solving. Well, there is a, a loss function called TRSF. So, we just, you know, in the case where uh, we use Mary, we just call the Mary TRSF function. Uh, for echelonize, for example, um, there's a solution for computing the row echelon form. So, there's a really high level interface, and that has a call to the Mary's uh, and it was actually, that solution was developed, the interface of that solution was developed with the very in mind so that it's, the interface is adapted to that. Yeah, so if I want to control the memory layout of when things go over in a particular way, so can, I, can I do things like keeping your point and saying, I, I want this matrix to be right here? Um, yes. Um, I think not so much with the built-in matrix types. So if you use the built-in data dense matrix, then it contains its own vector, and then the vector uses the standard STL allocator. But as I said before, one is free to implement one's own matrix type as long as it provides the same interface. 
And in particular, there doesn't even have to be a matrix underlying it. I mean, one doesn't have to have a physical matrix uh, underlying the class. One could, for example, in principle, just have a, um, say, a set of polynomials, and then leave that set of polynomials appear to be a matrix. Okay, then this was the after the test.